Good morning and welcome to our service today. Thank you uh, for joining us. So this week, Pastor Dan has asked me to speak on this third Sunday of Lent. Now, over the past two weeks, as we've been going through Lent, our main theme has been on reestablishing focus in a disciplined manner, while also keeping a single-minded way of thinking, uh, not, not falling into uh, double-mindedness. So two weeks ago, uh, Dave mentioned that uh, the 40 days of Lent is a time of discipleship and growth. Dave also spoke on how when we are faced with personal suffering, indecision can arise, leading to double-mindedness, which pushes us off the path we're on. Last week, Pastor Dan talked about uh, seducers and obstructors that can lead us astray. And he did this by looking at when Peter tried to convince Jesus that he didn't need to suffer on the cross, but instead could enjoy the fame and all the perks of having a large fallen. Today, we'll be continuing our journey through Lent and continuing this thought of where is our focus and how can we be more single-minded. We'll be walking through scripture, beginning with Exodus, before going to John for our gospel reading followed by some thoughts from Paul in 1 Corinthians. Uh, just to note, uh, just a thing to note before we get started, in last week's sermon, Pastor Dan mentioned and briefly talked about Jesus speaking on where he would be heading, which was to the cross. And in today's scripture, we see more of that. And with that being said, let's begin by looking at our scripture for today. Our first passage of scripture is from Exodus 20, uh, beginning at verse 1, going to verse 17. Uh, This passage will set the tone and set the scene for the other scriptures that follow, and is one of the pieces of today's puzzle. So, grab your Bibles and turn to Exodus 20, uh, again beginning at verse 1, and follow along. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water, waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the, of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servants, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Honor your mother and your father, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So this section of scripture is probably pretty familiar to most of us. It's God giving the Ten Commandments and the law to Moses and the people of Israel as they journey through the wilderness towards the promised land. Now, when we read these verses, there are a few things that stand out to me. The first is that God reminds the Israelites of who he is and what he has done for them in verse 2 by saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Verses 3 to 5 highlight the importance and the seriousness of God when it comes to worshiping other gods that they may have heard of or learned about while they were in Egypt or during their wanderings. Verse 5 and 6 also highlight one of God's character traits in which we read, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love and keep my commandments. 
in these three commandments and the fourth one, which states do not misuse the name of the Lord or use it in vain, we see a pattern or a theme emerge, which is love for God. This is a theme that will continue to appear throughout scripture, but that's not our focus for today. In the six commandments that follow these four, we see a different pattern, a different theme emerge, which is all about loving our neighbor, which is again, something we see continue throughout scripture, but again, isn't our focus for today. Now, at this point in time, in the Exodus story, this is the beginning of the Israelites receiving God's law, which is God's, God's wisdom given to the people to live their lives, prosper, and be free. Now, this may have been a struggle or strange to some of the Israelites, as this law was completely different than what the laws they had lived under in Egypt. They had gone from being, an oppressed, uh, being oppressed by power and wealth in Egypt to being a new and free people under God. These laws were given to show and to let people know how to live. So at this moment in the story, everything seems fine. But as the Old Testament narrative continues, things go from good to bad, which leads us to our next passage of scripture today. So our next passage is found in John chapter two, uh, verses 13 to 22. Now, in the past few weeks, we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark, which, as Pastor Dan has mentioned, is kind of like the action version or the action account due to the fast-paced movement and that it's the shortest of the four Gospel accounts. Now, the Gospel of John is also different than the other three Gospel accounts. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all generally follow the same pattern or line of events, whereas John has the events and timing of these events placed a little differently. Uh, for example, we've been looking at the temptation of Jesus and the rebuking of Peter, which Mark has at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. While John, on the other hand, has the wedding at Cana with changing water into wine at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. As you read the Gospel of John, there are a few things to take note of. One of these is John's use of the word signs. Uh, John uses this when describing seven different miracles Jesus performed and uses the word signs as if he were pointing us towards something, something greater to come. John also focuses on topics like light, the word, and the spirit, just to name a few. Now, there's also been some debate as to who exactly wrote the Gospel of John, but that's another discussion for another time. Uh, the writer of John also likes to point things out as well that we'll see at the end of today's passage. Now, with that in mind, let's read John chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those he sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So there's a lot that happens in this passage, so let's break it down. The first thing to notice is that this is during the time approaching Passover, the Jewish remembrance of when the angel of death passed over the Israelite doors in Egypt that were covered in the lamb's blood. Now, in the Gospel of John, the Passover is mentioned three different times. Uh, the Passover mentioned here is the first of those three and is believed to happen during Jesus' Jesus's first year of his ministry. As the passage continues, we learn that the temple courts have essentially become a farmer's market. Now, you should be seeing a layout or a map of what the temple courts look 
looked like during the time of Jesus. Jesus would have done this act in the court of the Gentiles, where anyone was allowed to gather and pray in the temple. Jesus did most of his teaching in, this, in the court of the Gentiles because it was open to so many people. Now, this leads us to the question, why were there money exchangers and people selling animals? The money exchangers could be explained due to the temple tax that Israelites had to pay in order to help maintain the temple and the selling of animals to those who were unable to bring their own to sacrifice in accordance with the law. In John, it says that Jesus called it a market, but in the other gospel accounts, we read that Jesus calls it a den of robbers. Those in charge of, ex of exchanging money and the sale of the animals had other concerns on their mind. They had lost focus on the aspect of worship and prayer, the purpose of the temple but were instead consumed by greed, corruption, and wealth, wanting to make as much as they could for their own profit. Once Jesus was done flipping tables and driving out the vendors, there was still a crowd gathered, and some Jews began questioning Jesus and his authority. In verse 18, they ask, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to, well, to do all this? The Jews wanted more proof from Jesus. But... Instead of performing a sign, Jesus, resp Jesus responds with, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Here, Jesus is pointing to his death on the cross and resurrection, as verse 21 mentions. But the Jews questioned Jesus, took him in the literal sense. They began to question Jesus' motives, actions, and abilities even more. So now the Jews probably think that Jesus is foolish in his ways of acting and his thinking since he just destroyed a bunch of stuff and gave a response they weren't expecting. Three days? Yeah, right. This temple took 46 years to build, and you can almost hear the condescending tone in their voices. This section ends with the narrator explaining after the resurrection how the disciples then understood what Jesus was, a talk was talking about. Verse 22 highlights the wisdom and the knowledge that the disciples had gained as a result of their own foolishness. But there's still a question that remains. Why did the Jews demand a sign? What was it about signs that the Jews valued so much? Well, our third passage for today will help us understand that and give us a bit more insight while bringing all of our scriptures together. So our last passage from today comes from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, specifically, the first chapter beginning at verse 18, going to verse 25. Here's what it says. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believed. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than hu human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. So, in this passage, Paul really narrows in on the aspect of wisdom, where it comes from, and what it means. Much like how Jesus pointed to the cross in his ministry, Paul does the same thing, pointing us back to the symbolism of the cross. In John, when Jesus spoke of destroying and rebuilding the temple, the Jews would have seen that as foolish. And here, Paul is saying that our foolishness to believe in Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection is actually God's wisdom and God's strength. Paul makes a statement in verse 22 about the Jews asking for signs as a way for them to find wisdom as they would see the cross as a stumbling block and foolish. 
It was probably a common thought among Jews and Greeks around the time of Jesus' death to think, really, the Messiah was killed on a tree? Doesn't seem so strong or like his plan worked out. Paul then takes this and pretty much makes a fool out of the Jews and Greeks, saying that when we assume or think of God as being foolish, it's still wiser than any human wisdom. Paul also points out that when we assume that God is being weak, that weakness is still stronger than any human strength. So what does this mean for us? As we've read today, all three of these passages cover a wide range of themes and might not seem like they relate to each other. But when we look at them together through the lens of God's wisdom, we begin to see a connection. Through the law in Exodus and the Ten Commandments, we see God giving his people his wisdom and his strength to live and to prosper. When we come to John, we see that God's people have ignored his wisdom and used their own strength for corruption and oppression while they look to man and signs for wisdom. But instead, in what can be seen as a foolish act flipping tables, Jesus points us to the coming cross and God's wisdom and strength in his death. Even the disciples didn't understand this until after he had been resurrected, as John says. Lastly, Paul drives home that our wisdom and strength will never be anywhere close to the wisdom that God has and the power that God has. Paul also points to the crucifixion as a sign of wisdom instead of foolishness, along with the importance of the cross, which would be counter to the culture of the time. But what about today? How does this apply to our lives? How does this affect our day-to-day? -day? Well, as we've seen, Lent is a time of refocusing ourselves in a disciplined manner. I think during this time, we need to ask ourselves, where do we seek wisdom? Are we like the Jews from the passage, where we seek wisdom in signs and what's going on in the world? Or are we like the Greeks, Paul describes, looking to man for answers and for wisdom? Or do we turn our gaze towards God and his infinite, infinite wisdom and power that is beyond any and all human understanding to seek wisdom? There will be some in our world to think that what we do is foolish and not a normal part of society or culture. But as we have read, this foolishness is actually God's power and wisdom for us to live and be free as a part of a counterculture. So, as we've done in the past few weeks, we're going to finish up with our psalm reading for today. If you would like to read along with me, go ahead, or you can t spend these moments reflecting on what is being said by the psalmist. And our psalm reading from today for today is from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decree of the Lord, decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is a great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. But keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thank you for joining us today, and may God be with you in this week. Take care, friends.